Our topic today is the ICFA, the um, economic agreement between China and Taiwan, free, free trade agreement between China and Taiwan. And we're going to be exploring the costs and benefits to Taiwan of the ECFA, um, domestic politics, the, the tensions that the ECFA has perhaps generated and, uh, and, and the consequences of those tensions, um, and also the effect that the ECFA might have on Taiwan's um, ability or um, desire to carve out um, a diplomatic space to help us discuss uh, these topics, we have um, a great panel whose experience in the worlds of business, politics, and, uh, and, and international relations is unmatched. Terry Cook, who will be our first speaker, is the founder and CEO of GC3 Strategy, an international consultancy focused on providing strategic uh, services to greater China. He has a long, or has had a long, uh, long career in the foreign service. He served as the U.S. government's senior commercial representative in Taipei and Berlin, um, as the deputy senior commercial representative in Tokyo, and as commercial officer in Shanghai. He earned his Ph.D. at the University of California at Berkeley in 1985, and this year we're happy to say that he was also a Wilson Center Public Policy Scholar. Shelley Rigger is the Brown Professor of East Asian Politics at Davidson College. Um, she has also been a visiting professor at various institutions, including National Chengchi University in Taiwan. And she's the author of two books on Taiwan's domestic politics, Politics in Taiwan, Voting for Democracy, and From Opposition to Power, Taiwan's Democratic Pro Progressive Party. She has a PhD from Harvard. And our third speaker will be David Brown. He's um, adjunct professor in Chinese and Asian studies at the Paul, a Paul H. Hitzer School of Advanced International Studies. Um, he's also served at, as the associate director of Asian studies at SAIS. Um, he also has had a long career in the US State Department, um, including postings to Taipei, Tokyo, Beijing, Hong Kong, Saigon, as well as uh, postings in Europe. He served uh, as director of the Taiwan Coordination Staff in the State Department from 1986 to 1989, and as Deputy Consul General in Hong Kong from 1989 to 1992. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. I'll hand things over to Terry, but first um, I'd hope that you could uh, join me in welcoming our three guests. Thanks. Thank you, Bryce. It's very nice to be back here. It was just a couple of weeks ago that I was in residence here, focusing on a slightly different topic for my appointment, which was US-China clean energy cooperation. But having been involved with the ECFA issue uh, for a number of years, uh, particularly immediately after serving at the American Institute in Taiwan, where I had the honor and privilege to also work with Richard Bush. Uh, it's great to be talking on this topic, particularly after the milestone uh, that uh, this process long in gestation has been able to reach. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the business and the economics perspective, and just to tee things up, I'll, I'll just use kind of big broad brush strokes and try to make a limited number of hopefully cogent points. First of all, just to, for the benefit of anyone in the audience who might have a question mark, you know, what is the ECFA? The ECFA is the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement agreed to between Taiwan and uh, China, actually, month, or June 25th. Yeah, June 25th, thank you. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm uh, a little bit focused on a different set of details right now in my research. But uh, I think the two most uh, helpful ways of thinking about what the ECFA is uh, is either in its substance, it is essentially a bilateral free trade style agreement 
that has been modified to adjust for the sovereignty concerns that both Taiwan and China have about one another. In a process sense, it is the culmination of something that really kind of started off during the uh, APEC days when uh, Chinese and Taiwan officials would meet on the sidelines of the APEC talks and then um, they continued that discussion at the BOAL summit and in the lead up or the campaign prior to Chen Shui-bian, uh, Mai ying Zhou's election, there was some campaign talk about the possibility of some kind of an agreement following his election and inauguration. There was a process put in place that first built on the uh, longstanding three links type of agreements, strengthening those, then it moved on to a financial services agreement, and then finally this more comprehensive framework called the ECFA was agreed to. Um, so one point that I would like to make, which many people ask me, given my perspective rooted in economics and business, is you know, it's really tough to keep track of all the details of what's happening economically and commercially. All we really want to know is from, a, let's say, a U.S. standpoint, does this mean that it's possible to withdraw um, some of the, the naval personnel uh, based in Japan because all of this is going to inexorably lead to a uh, warm and happy outcome? Unfortunately, the problem with the economic and commercial trend analysis is while it may describe transformational events, and while those transformational events may be quite apparent and deeply rooted in the tectonics of what's going on, they are not determinative. And it is the political decision making that always remains determinative. So no matter how positive and long-standing the commercial and economic trend may look, you need, you, you can't stop there. A second point that I would make, uh, the English translation of a Chinese four character proverb or cheng yu, which is frequently cited in connection with the ECFA is the, the same bed, different dreams phenomenon. Uh, let me go back just for a moment. We were talking about the process that produced ECFA. One characteristic is that in the, the basic bargaining uh, that took place in the lead up and in, then in the conclusion of the ECFA, there is a slightly asymmetrical aspect to the protections that were built into the ECFA as well as the surface analysis of the economic benefit of the ECFA. Um, one explanation, and, and Taiwan got the arguably the best economic deal measured either through the industry protections that were built into it or into the priorities for inclusion that either side asked for. Uh, one way of explaining that is simply by virtue of China's scale, that the size of, Chinese, of China's economy is so disproportionate to the size of Taiwan that it was necessary to develop a sense of um, political comfort with what all this might mean to build in those levels of protection. But I think there's a reason that goes beyond purely a scale phenomenon. It has to do with the apparent motivations of the two sides in concluding the deal. And although I can't cite any single document to necessarily prove this, I would uh, say with a fair amount of confidence that the motivation on uh, 
uh, Zhongnanhai or, or Beijing's side is pretty clearly to use these economic blandishments or to use this set of economic agreements as a way to bring Taiwan more within its orbit with the implication that being closer within uh, a economic orbit implies over time some greater degree of political control. So that would seem to be the dream which Beijing has in the ECFA bed. The Taiwan dream is arguably quite different. Uh, Taiwan has a great deal of uh, confidence in what its industry has been able to bring about over the last um, particularly since the 1980s when light industry sectors started migrating across the Strait of Taiwan to China, followed in the 1990s by the information technology sector. And to, uh, to this day, when I left AIT in 2002, Taiwan represented roughly 70% of China's IT hardware sector. Th that's an absolutely astounding figure. And we, we all understand that in a very controlled sector like media, uh, nothing happens in China without the control and the assent of the Chinese government. But in a quite globally significant sector, like information, I, IT hardware, China has been open following its mission to the WTO to the extent that uh, Tongbao Taiwan compatriots across the strait essentially own and control 70% of a major industry sector. This was reflected in the, over the summer, in all of the news coverage about the strikes against the Japanese plants and the efforts of Beijing to increase wages of its workers in the factories because the number one company that became the focus of that um, debate was uh, Foxconn, uh, which in Taiwan is known as Honhai, uh, which employs 400,000 people on the mainland. Uh, they're, uh, essentially the largest private employer outside of major state owns. So my point here is simply that there is an enormous amount of confidence on the part of the Taiwanese industrialists who have been active on the mainland. And despite the very uh, energetic political debate that takes place in Taiwan, which I'm sure David and Shelley will both be able to shed light on, I think it's fair to say that for the mainstream of Taiwan opinion, there is a belief, a maybe anxious belief, but nonetheless a belief and a degree of confidence that they can manage a much closer commercial embrace with China without being pulled in to the political orbit. And from this point of view, uh, I mentioned first what the ECFA was in substantive terms, and then I mentioned what it was in process terms. Let me also add the comment of what it really represents to my mind in historic terms. We, we did that quick survey from the, 18, from the 1980s with light industry through the IT hardware and then basically speaking, as globalization proceeded apace, um, relatively lightly regulated sectors of the economy such as light industry, the old umbrella manufacturers, the bicycle manufacturers were either, were either given the green light by Taiwan's government back in the 1980s to go across or they somewhat ignored the 
regulatory advice of the Taiwan government and, and established operations over in the mainland. And IT was the golden boom years, and that 70% figure shows how much success they had. What was left out of this equation were the earlier, heavier industries that had Taiwan government uh, shareholding and that were too big and visible to be able to follow the lead of what the bicycle manufacturers did. This is the auto parts suppliers, the machinery companies, the um, steel-related companies. Those companies never got their chance to go over to the mainland. They were at an earlier stage of industrial development, and they just couldn't get any kind of green light to do that. So what ECFA represents in regional terms is a rationalization from a globalization perspective of a economic integration in the region that uh, developed very well with light industry and with IT hardware, but it missed a whole important sector of heavy industry. So I want to wind up my time with, um, I can make this really one single and concluding point, which is that the economic relationship can be, be seen as a triangular relationship between the U.S., Taiwan, China, and back to the U.S. What has really happened post Lehman Brothers, post September 15, 2008 uh, global recession, is that Asian exporters went into an absolute precipitous dive because their exports were dependent on access to uh, North American and European markets that were badly hit. But they have managed for various reasons on a regional basis to bounce back very strongly. And I think everyone knows China quickly got back to 9% plus growth. Ch uh, Taiwan itself, M most of its exports go to China, which then get reprocessed uh, for exports to other markets. Taiwan is enjoying uh, unprecedented growth in its recent economic history, whereas everything in uh, the U.S. and in Europe is continuing to lag and continuing to suffer economic contraction from tight credit. So as represented by the political ECFA agreement, things are just going gangbusters right now in Asia and across the Strait of Taiwan. When we look at those two other economic legs between the U.S. and Taiwan on the one hand and U.S. and China on the other hand, for different reasons, they are not as robust. The U.S.-Taiwan relationship has um, been impeded for a number of years by some fairly technical issues through what is called the Trade Work Investment Framework Agreement, or TIFA, talks. And there was a recent problem uh, over beef imports, which is largely kind of a political communications issue. Um, and the relatively new Obama administration has still not formulated a clear Asia-focused trade policy. And because Taiwan is not the biggest country in the region, uh, it has kind of a little bit seemed to have gone down towards the bottom of the inbox. There are some very recent moves afoot that, that offer some degree of hope that, that uh, the corner may be turned on that and that there is positive attention being paid. But over the last two years, writ large, there has been uh, a degree of, of invisibility on that issue and, and lack of progress. And on the U.S.-China side, we are in a political season or political cycle in Washington. I had a chance to scan the New York Times for five minutes before 
leaving Philadelphia to come down here today, and the three China stories in the New York Times today are all um, trade-related. Many of them have to do with the clean tech sector that I'm looking at, but they're all uh, kind of negative stories about the current state of our economic relationship with China. So I would just say there's, a, there's kind of a political cloud hanging over that, and, and China has done a certain amount over the last year to shoot itself in, in its foot with the U.S. business community, which has been one of its major advocates and, and uh, supporters over the 27 years since uh, economic liberalization began in China. So on both those fronts, the loss of confidence of the U.S. business community, whether the door is still really open in China or whether it's swinging shut, and then the fact that as part of a political cycle, we're in clearly a difficult period. What that means in sum is that there's one leg of the triangle which is extremely robust, and there are two legs of the triangle, unfortunately, which both involve the U.S., which are a little bit shaky and flimsy right now. And fundamentally, my analysis and recommendation is that things are best when all three legs of that triangle are strong. Uh, that suggests that there's a little bit of introspection and work that should happen in this town and down the street on Pennsylvania Avenue to remedy that situation. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, I would feel more confident about where things were and where they were going if all three legs of that economic triangle were strong and robust. And with that, uh, I'll stop and thank you. Thanks, Terry. Our next speaker is Shelley Rigger. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Uh, looking past Terry, I see the photograph of President Wilson, I guess it is, my vision is not terrific, in his academic garb, which reminds me that President Wilson attended Davidson College, my institution, um, for some time in his youth, although uh, he graduated from another institution. <laughs> but uh, we claim him as a little bit of our own down in Davidson, so it's always a delight to be back here with my senior colleague, President Wilson, um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And also with my uh, colleagues here today, it is, as always, an honor and pleasure. ECFA has been hailed as a breakthrough in cross-strait relations and also as a breakthrough for Taiwan's economy. And yet there has been really intense political maneuvering and uh, discourse and debate around ECFA, both before, during its negotiation, and then following the signing of ECFA, there was still a lot of churn within Taiwan about how to, how to think about ECFA and what to do about ECFA. And I think it's an interesting question to ask, why has something which is hailed as a breakthrough created so much anxiety and debate. And I think it is actually precisely because ECFA is viewed as a breakthrough that it has produced this very fraught political reaction. Within Taiwan, most people are quite anxious about the future, quite anxious about how Taiwan will navigate its own position in light of a very rapidly rising China. China is increasing its economic might, obviously, but also its global political influence and even its military uh, power. And people in Taiwan are, are thinking a lot about how Taiwan can, can maintain its position as a politically autonomous and ideally sovereign uh, state in the shadow of this rising China. The best case scenario, it seems, is for Taiwan to maintain a very delicate and difficult balance between appearing to be too separate from China and provoking the PRC to action in order to reel Taiwan in, 
balancing that against the desire that is shared by nearly everyone in Taiwan to maintain its separate status and, and political autonomy. So it seems that the best Taiwan can hope to do is to maintain this balance. Well, if you're focused on balance, you're always thinking about tipping points. You're always thinking about what could happen that would create an imbalance that would make it impossible for us to recover, that would, that would turn the situation beyond the point of no return. And I think there is a very thin line in our understanding of these concepts between a breakthrough and a tipping point. So I think something that gets as much press and as much attention as ECFA for being a breakthrough very quickly attracts this anxious attention as Taiwanese begin to ask themselves, is this one of those things? Is this one of those events or, or sh you know, changes in the force that is going to be irreversible and going to leave us really in a, a position where we can't maneuver? Add to that the uncertainty on all sides of this issue, and I think you have even more reason for ECFA to have provoked such strong political reactions. There's the usual uncertainty. You know, in, in all human interactions, there's a lot of uncertainty, and when you're talking about nation states, there's even more. But I think in this case, we add to the usual uncertainty and contingency in international politics the nagging knowledge that everyone has on all sides of this issue that the other side's ultimate goals are at best different from their own and most likely incompatible with their own. In other words, everyone in the PRC understands that there is little, well not everyone, but I think in the, in the PRC leadership and among those in China who are thinking hard about ECFA and issues like it, there is an understanding that in Taiwan there is little to no impulse for actual formal political unification. So that people in the PRC understand that they have one set of goals and Taiwan has a separate set of goals. Likewise, in Taiwan, there's pretty wide understanding that the ultimate objective that the Beijing leadership cherishes is of actual political unification between Taiwan and China. So each side, in a sense, understands that perhaps not with specific reference to ECFA, but in general in their interactions, each side is trying to outfox the other and gain the upper hand in order to use short-term progress to secure long-term objectives. So even when the short-term progress represents a win-win opportunity in the short term, it's still viewed with suspicion because it is understood as part of a longer and larger game in which a win-win outcome is much harder to envision because of these contradictory objectives. So for these reasons, and I'm sure for others that I haven't mentioned as well, ECFA has provoked political responses in at least three capitals because there are at least three governments that have ambivalence about it. First of all, in Beijing, uh, Joseph Wong from the University of Toronto has described ECFA as a loss leader for the Beijing government. Uh, that is to say, the, I think he would agree with you, Terry, that the uh, economics of ECFA work well for Taiwan, are disproportionately favorable to Taiwan, but this is a loss leader because the idea is that in the long run uh, it will advance Beijing toward its long-term goals. The problem is it's a loss leader for a deal that may not close, that the, those long-term benefits that uh, the PRC is hoping to get may not actually materialize. So there's ambivalence about ECFA for that reason. So the PRC wants better relations with Taiwan in the short run and it wants to win hearts and minds in Taiwan in the long run in pursuit of its objective of unification, 
So the political concessions and the economic losses are worthwhile in the short term. But at the same time, there are many in Beijing who fear that any political gains that Beijing gets from ECFA will be short-lived. And that makes them reluctant to follow through on the political concessions that uh, I think the Taiwanese leadership is very much hoping will emerge as a consequence of ECFA, starting with international space for Taiwan. In Taipei, there is a perception that ECFA can stabilize cross-strait relations and provide economic benefits to Taiwan, but it may exacerbate Taiwan's political vulnerability in the long run. And so that feeds then the anxiety and politics on the Taiwan side. And here I would just say that, uh, you know, there's, a, there's certainly a huge debate about Taiwan's future in, within Taiwan's political uh, arena, but it is a debate about how Taiwan can be autonomous, politically autonomous. It's not a debate over whether Taiwan should be politically autonomous. So within the, within the broad consensus, with it, the, held by Taiwanese uh, that Taiwan should remain autonomous, there's then this kind of secondary debate, which is, all right, we all agree to that, but how can we do it? For the KMT, so the issues related to ECFA are different for the two poli main political parties in Taiwan, the KMT and the DPP. The KMT wants to be the moneymaker for Taiwan, wants to promote policies that will be advantageous to Taiwan's economy, but it worries, it fears, that the benefits that accrue to Taiwan out of the ECFA agreement will be too limited and won't satisfy the expectations of Taiwanese voters. You know, that, that we're kind of going to get to the end of the early harvest list and people are going to say, is this all we get? And that will leave the KMT in the position of having, um, being vulnerable to the accusation at least that it has made Taiwan more it has exposed Taiwan more to, ta to China's political influence and gotten too little in exchange. For the DPP, for the Democratic Progressive Party, the pros and cons of ECFA are in a sense reversed. The DPP would like to oppose ECFA and reap the political gains that are associated with popular anxieties about the ECFA agreement. So they know that there is a lot of uncertainty and uh, worry about ECFA among Taiwanese voters, and they would like to be able to benefit from that politically. But at the same time, the DPP doesn't want to be the boy who cried wolf, right, who says, this is going to be terrible, this is going to be a catastrophe, this is bad for Taiwan. And if it isn't, then their credibility is diminished. And they also don't want to be the party that's opposed to people making money. And if ECFA turns out to be good for Taiwan economically, it doesn't do to have been the party that said it was a bad idea. So Taiwan as a whole has ambivalence about ECFA, and each of Taiwan's major political parties has ambivalence. I think in Washington there's a certain amount of ambivalence as well. On the one hand, the U.S. government would, is very eager to, to have the cross-strait problem neutralized as a source of trouble for U.S. foreign policy. But at the same time, we see signs that people in Washington are worried about what some have called the Finlandization of Taiwan, that Taiwan may be drawn too close to Beijing's orbit and that will introduce a new kind of unpredictability and instability into the region. One thing to note here is that the PRC government is unified in its, at least its, its public communication about ECFA. While I think there is certainly politics and there is certainly disagreement about ECFA within the PRC government, it, this doesn't easily rise to the level of an open debate or uh, 
um, split within the PRC. Obviously, Taiwan is not united, or the political forces within Taiwan are not united on how they view ECFA and what they think should be done about it. And paradoxically, I would say this strengthens Taiwan, at least in the short term, because it has forced the PRC, and I think we can already see this in the, in the economic deliverables of ECFA, it forces the PRC to give more to Taiwan, knowing that the KMT government will have to ratify this agreement in a society that is pretty skeptical about it. So paradoxically, I think, at least in the short run, Taiwan's more active political and open political debate has actually increased Taiwan's bargaining leverage with respect to ECFA. However, that may not be a durable advantage because I think the PRC can afford to wait out this ratification problem and readjust its strategy later on. And that leads to a kind of fundamental dimension of the ECFA agreement, which is that the success of this approach for Taiwan, for the Maingyo government, rests on the PRC government's forbearance and on Taiwan's self-restraint. So there's no particular reason to expect that just because we've gotten this far that we have permanently neutralized the potential for conflict in the Taiwan Strait. Conflict could be reinitiated by either side. So the success of this strategy rests on China forbearing and Taiwan self-restraining, and neither of those is necessarily guaranteed. As just one final quick postscript, I would uh, like to say something a little more uh, global or general about ECFA. I think ECFA reveals something very important for Taiwan and for the PRC, but also for, the, for developed countries in general, for countries that find themselves economically in the same position as Taiwan. And this is really rooted in the way ECFA has not affected the political fortunes of Taiwan's parties. I think what we are discovering is that economic benefits will translate into political advantage for the KMT only if they trickle down only if they have measurable benefits to a broad segment of Taiwan's society. And this, I think, is not necessarily what we expected all along. That there was the expectation that if Mainjo could engineer or preside over, perhaps better, than, well, better way to put it than engineer, an economic recovery for Taiwan, an early economic recovery for Taiwan, which he certainly has done. We expected that he would gain some political advantage from that economic recovery. And by and large, he really hasn't. His poll numbers have not rebounded with Taiwan's economy. And I think a, an important reason for that, there are many reasons for that, but one that we, that, that merits close consideration is that the economic benefits that Taiwanese see deriving from the kind of recovery Taiwan is having, which is driven in part by the same forces that will be invigorated by ECFA, this economic recovery is not going to extend to Taiwan society in a way that all will benefit equally or even perhaps at all. And I think Taiwan's unique political position has made it kind of a canary in the coal mine for developed countries in this era of globalization. But we all face the same two problems that have left Taiwan in this predicament and specifically left President Ma in this predicament. First of all, how does Taiwan preserve its relative economic advantage as the PRC rises and as the PRC's economy grows, how does Taiwan 
stay ahead. And there's not a lot of confidence in Taiwan, I think, that that's going to happen. And then the second question that Taiwan faces before the rest of us, but that we all are, in fact, facing, is there a way to leverage the benefits of engagement, for Taiwan it's engagement with China, for the rest of it it's globalization in general, to deliver benefits to everyone, to all of Taiwan's people, rather than having those benefits flow selectively to a small segment of the population, which produces aggregate growth, but doesn't produce any political benefit for a party in power. So I will leave it there and welcome your questions when Professor Brown is finished. Excellent. Our next speaker is David Brown. Uh, thank you, Bryce, and thank you um, and Bob both for inviting me to come back. I've always found uh, discussions here at the Wilson Center very enlivening and enlightening, and I certainly have learned already a little bit, and I hope you will all find that to be the case. I was uh, tasked with talking about the linkage between ECFA and regional trade liberalization, or perhaps more precisely put, Taiwan's participation in regional trade liberalization, which is a, a narrow but politically, I think, very important subject. Uh, there are several linkages which I will uh, work through. The first has to do uh, with a large part of the motivation behind uh, Taiwan's pursuit of ECFA and the hope that the pursuit of ECFA would lead uh, to participation in trade liberalization. And that's because for the past decade, Taiwan has been left out of an important process in Asia where trade has been liberalizing. It's been left out because the one forum it participates in, APEC, is no longer uh, pursuing trade liberalization as an agenda. It's been left out because it is excluded from the most important fora that are pursuing trade liberalization. This is ASEAN and its ties uh, bilaterally with China and trilaterally with China, Japan, and Korea. And thirdly, it's left out because the other route that you can take to tie yourself in to the region is through FTAs, and China's political clout has been sufficient to dissuade any of Taiwan's regional trade partners from pursuing an FTA uh, with Taiwan. Ma Zhou got elected in large part on a platform of trying to restore robust economic growth uh, to Taiwan. He unfortunately took office just as the global recession was beginning, so he has had a tough row to hoe. But all along, his approach had envisaged closer economic ties with China as one key element in a integrated approach to restoring growth to the Taiwan economy. And linked to that was uh, the hope that uh, that too would open up doors for Taiwan more broadly in the region. The immediate catalyst for pursuing something called ECFA, and as Terry mentioned in Ma's campaign, there really wasn't specific reference to this type of economic agreement, and certainly the term didn't exist at the time. The specific catalyst was the fact that the ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement was going to come into effect on January 1st of this year. And the Taiwan business community knew this, and so early in 2009, they began pushing uh, the Ma administration to do something uh, to put them in a less unfavorable competitive con uh, position in the China market. And some of the industries that Terry referred to were amongst the leaders in pushing the government in this direction. And it was in uh, the spring of 2009 that the Ma administration began uh, talking to Beijing and talking publicly about uh, concluding something which has come to be called ECFA. And from the beginning, one of their, as I said, one of their hopes was that this would not just be a bilateral agreement, but it one b would be one that would open some kind of door uh, 
that would uh, allow t a Taiwan to escape from this trap of being mar marginalized uh, regionally. As, uh, as Shelley described, this was a bitterly contentious issue in Taiwan. Uh, one particular point in the process, uh, Ma ying Zhou and Tsai Ing-wen, the chairman of the DPP, agreed, in fact, to have a, their first and only major uh, personal confrontation and debate, and it was over this particular issue. And in trying to make the case to the Taiwan public for why ECFA would be in Taiwan's benefit, Ma uh, gave particular prominence to the idea that by concluding ECFA, China would step aside and leave open the possibility for Taiwan to have FTA-like agreements with its regional trade partners. He upped the ante in this debate by saying that this these uh, FTA agreements were so important that he was personally going to lead a task force uh, after ECFA was concluded to pursue those agreements. And two days later, he returned to that theme, saying that this was going to be a high priority and the government was going to push hard once ECFA was concluded. So this linkage was always an important part of the salesmanship of ECFA to a uh, reluctant uh, Taiwanese public. And to a certain degree, uh, the DPP was cooperating with him because in their arguments against uh, ECFA, they expressed considerable skepticism that Beijing would ever let that door open. And so in a way, one way to look at this is that Ma ying Zhou was uh, engaged in something of a poker game with Beijing and that he was upping the anti, <coughs> upping the ante by saying, in effect, uh, we've got not just to have ECFA, but in the period after that, I need uh, Beijing's cooperation in order to have the door open and use that as part of the selling point for the agreement. Just exactly two months after that debate, the agreement was signed. What did it say about uh, regional trade liberalization and FTAs? Nothing. What did the Chinese officials who were commenting profusely about the significance of F ECFA say about FTAs? Nothing. Uh, it's pretty clear that Taiwan had tried to set it up so that something would be said on this subject but Beijing did not come through at this particular point in the game. A week later, Ma goes on television to lay out the government's plans for how uh, they are going to build on the momentum uh, established by ECFA to uh, strengthen Taiwan's economic recovery. And he talks about basically three things improving the economic environment for investment in Taiwan, pursuing a, uh, a strengthened policy to encourage innovation on a range of different technologies in Taiwan, and of trying to promote uh, Taiwan's place, ex expand Taiwan's connections in the international economic community. And in this latter context, there is one short mention of FTAs nothing about the president playing a leading role in trying to advance them. An interesting little shift. Why? Uh, be happy to speculate in the question and answer period. But in any event, uh, the passage or the adoption or the conclusion of ECFA led to intense speculation about uh, would it open the door uh, to Taiwan's participation or not. I think every Taiwanese that I've talked to who traveled to China in this period, and certainly all Americans I've talked to traveled to China in this period, were asking Chinese officials, what are you going to do now on this issue? And found the Chinese uh, very circumspect in what they were prepared to say because they recognized that this was, uh, to use a flippant phrase, above their pay grade. <laughs> 
that this was an important political choice uh, for the leadership uh, in Beijing. Six weeks after ECFA is signed, Singapore and Taiwan announce that they're going to start this kind of talk. What they say is that they are going to pursue a WTO consistent economic cooperation agreement. And the way they announce it is quite important. Uh, the uh, word comes out in a joint statement issued by the two trade representative offices. Choosing this mechanism emphasizes that what they're talking about is a trade agreement and not something that is a big political issue. They very carefully avoid, as Terry explained, using the FTA terminology because that implies sovereignty. And they did not do something uh, which used language that Terry referred to. They did not talk about uh, this uh, deal or this arrangement that they were going to negotiate with Singapore as something that related to Taiwan's international space. It was approached as an economic issue and not as a diplomatic foreign policy, international relations type of issue. Okay, this announcement comes out of Singapore and Taiwan. What does Beijing do? They treat it also as a very low key, not terribly important uh, issue. Uh, the foreign ministry spokesman is asked about it and he says, uh, our policy is quite consistent. Countries that have diplomatic relations with us are free to preserve, pursue uh, economic ties with Taiwan and we uh, encourage them to abide by their one China commitments. That's all. The Taiwan Affairs Office, which is not speaking internationally but speaking to the people on Taiwan, says uh, we are confident that Taipei understands that in pursuing this, they will preserve the framework for cross-strait relations. Very low-key statement. I think part of the reason why these statements are so low-key on the, on the Beijing side as well as the Singapore and, and Taiwan side is because this is a politically sensitive issue in Taiwan and the leadership wants to handle it in a low-key fashion that does not provoke undue debate within China on this issue. All of this leaves me uh, the impression that this announcement was a very carefully orchestrated step uh, and I am left wondering how they worked it out because uh, Taiwan is not very, neither Taiwan nor Beijing are particularly open about how these sorts of sensitive issues uh, are in fact worked out. But I find it almost impossible to believe that either Taipei, the Ma government that is, or the Singapore government would have gone ahead and made this kind of announcement if they had not been quite sure that Beijing was not going to object. So why does Beijing uh, in this quiet way make a political step which is potentially uh, quite important for Taiwan in the sense that uh, even though uh, Beijing, uh, e even though Taipei and, and Singapore are not talking about this in a political or international relations context, in fact it has implications in those areas which are not fully consistent with Beijing's long-term goal of promoting unification. Why does Beijing do this? I think it's in part because they realize uh, that uh, this aspect of the ECFA issue is important politically for Ma's ability uh, to sell the agreement. Secondly, I think it is consistent with the general approach they took to ECFA, which was, uh, as T Terry said it, to be generous uh, to Taiwan. And third, uh, even though uh, it's not an international space issue, it's in fact, it was in fact handled by Singapore and Taipei in a way that is consistent with Hu Jintao's uh, six-point statement from uh, December 
2008 uh, for handling international space issues. And that is that as long as it doesn't create the impression of one, tai one Taiwan, one China, China can be reasonable and flexible in dealing with these issues. So a small door has been opened. Uh, Singapore and Taiwan have not concluded the agreement. Quite frankly, I think it is a close to zero possibility that they will not succeed in coming up with an economic cooperation agreement uh, and that uh, it will go forward. Taiwan has been quite circumspect in pursuing agreements with other of its ASEAN trade partners. Uh, things are going on quietly, I've been told, behind the scenes, but there is no public uh, campaign in Taipei to press for uh, high-profile progress rapidly, not just with Singapore but with other countries. And in fact, when the Philippines uh, Deputy Trade uh, Secretary mentioned uh, his expectation that Taipei and the Philippines would sign such an agreement by the end of this year, <coughs> two and a half months from now, uh, there was no public comment on it in Taipei at all. Uh, I think this is prudent on Taipei's part uh, to proceed uh, carefully uh, in uh, advancing its uh, agenda of having these FTA-like agreements with other uh, other countries. Uh, ECFA, I think, has had a measurable benefit on Taiwan's economic ties in the region quite apart from its ability to reach an uh, economic cooperation agreement eventually with Singapore. And perhaps the best example of this was a very large investment mission uh, which Minister Schur led to Indonesia about three weeks ago. Uh, and unusual in the sense that uh, Indonesia has not been in the forefront of having good relations with Taiwan and this area. Important also because it became known subsequently that President uh, Yudhoyono had sent a quiet message uh, to Minister Schur, an unusual thing because uh, Taiwan colleagues tell me that uh, this is the first example of President you know, uh, saying anything positive about Taiwan, offering uh, or encouraging Taiwan to think about in investing in a particular island uh, in Indonesia. Now, the island is not what you would say a, a rip-roaring investment opportunity, uh, but it's a sign uh, that uh, things are moving in Taiwan's direction. So I'd like to draw this to a conclusion uh, by saying that I think Beijing has uh, shown some remarkable and welcome flexibility on this uh, FTA-like uh, or the regional Taiwan's access to participation in regional trade liberalization. Very small step, very tentative. How far it'll go, we don't know, but I think it's quite uh, an important step. And I would say that it has contributed to what I think of in a slightly different way, I think, than Shelley does, that the debate about the short-term benefits of ECFA is pretty much over in Taiwan. If you think back to the bitterness of uh, the, the contention that existed when Chen Yun-lin made his first trip to Taiwan in uh, November of 2008, just on the tip of when this issue was beginning to come out and how bitter that was. And to see now that there is very little discussion of ECFA in the context of the ongoing campaigns tells me that uh, the short-term benefits have pretty much uh, been demonstrated. Whether the long-term benefits will be there is not known, and certainly the anxiety that Shelley talked about uh, is lingering still. And so with that, I look forward to the question and answer period. Great. Okay. Um, so we'll open things up for questions now. We've got quite a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> if I will ask you, please, to 
um, when when Michael comes around with the microphone, if you could wait for him. Um, if you could also state your name and any affiliations you might have, that will be great. So I guess we're going to Michael. Well, thanks very much for uh, nice presentations. This is Mike Fonte. I'm the DPP's liaison here in Washington. I think, Terry, the same bed, different dreams uh, analogy is interesting. And of course, the problem from the DPP's point of view is what dreams are President Ma and the KMT actually have about the future relationship of Taiwan and China? That's the first, I think, fundamental difference. That's why when Chen Yunlin came, there was all hell broke loose, because the concern was that Ma's rhetoric about, well, there's one China, there's a mainland region and a Taiwan region. All that talk about one China that President Ma has, incur has spoken out highly has really undercut or is very different than the DPP's position, let's put it that way. So there's a different, different dreams within Taiwan, I think. I think that's important. And then on the globalization issue, I agree with Shelley. It raises the really larger question of globalization and its impact. We are feeling that, of course, ourselves. GDP's going up, stock market's going mostly up, but jobs aren't coming back. Why? It's a multiple problem. But in Taiwan, you can see the worry about, is this really going to be a full free trade agreement with full flow of goods and services and people, and what's that going to do to 23 million versus one? So I think the arguments from the DPP, while they've been toned down because the current uh, focus is on municipal elections, uh, and there is the early harvest, which is a benefit to Taiwan, no doubt about that. The question of long term is really in, a, in the DPP's mind, at least. So having got that off my chest, what I want to ask is actually what has struck me recently in listening to Bob Hormatz, Kurt Campbell, Jim Steinberg, and others is the emphasis on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because it seems to me, if I understand what they're talking about, is this is an attempt to keep the United States in the game in Asia. ASEAN plus three keeps the United States out of the game. Um, so I'd like to know what you think about that as a, I mean, I realize it's still beginning and it's, it's not nowhere near viable yet. But I know that Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, the DPP chair, has made the argument that Taiwan should go to China by first going to the world and then to China, as opposed to her characterization of President Ma going to China and then to the world. And I think the TPP could be that, but I'd like to hear what you think about that. Um, quite briefly, I, I agree uh, that there is one bed and different dreams in Taiwan. I think it uh, speaks to the great strength of Taiwanese society that that is true and, and vibrantly so. Um, on the issue of uh, the, uh, the TPP, uh, you know, I'm a little bit at a disadvantage to, to try to uh, comment intelligently on that because I, I was a, a small part of a official policy process for the 15 years that I was with the U.S. Foreign Service and right now I'm, I'm an outside looking in and I'm not in the stream of, of information. To me as a um, private sector bystander just trying to make personal sense of it. it. It does seem that it was a, it represents a bit of a political strategy on the Obama administration's part that does make sense in a long-term perspective, but it does worry me in terms of the short term, precisely because the TPP is such a kind of fledgling vehicle, and because the Democratic Party, when it returned to power, had a certain ambivalence because of trade and environmental interests in the party, how to deal with the kind of existing apparatus of economic engagement with Asia, uh, I sometimes kind of personally wonder whether it's a way of punting on the immediate difficult short-term issues with a longer-term process. 
Uh, Richard Bush from Brookings, thanks for a great uh, panel. Um, I would last like to ask about the other agreement that was signed on June 29th, having to do uh, with intellectual property rights protection. Um, I had to step out for a while. I don't know if Terry or anybody else talked about it. I if you did, I won't say anything. If you didn't, I'll ask my question. Um, seeing no demurs. Um, it, um, it strikes me that uh, this agreement is very important as part of a larger strategy by Taiwan to preserve its competitiveness even as it engages China. It's a vehicle for innovation. It's a vehicle for um, sort of staying ahead in, within the march of globalization. And unless Taiwan companies can protect uh, their most precious assets, um, the whole venture is going to come a cropper. Um, unless Taiwan can move to become a knowledge-based economy with all the legal infrastructure that that requires, uh, then uh, uh, the future doesn't seem so bright. Um, but that poses a challenge to China, because if China, through poor implementation of this agreement, uh, undermines this whole strategy, of the Taiwan government, then it only increases those in Taiwan who are skeptical about uh, the policy of engagement. Uh, the same applies to dispute re resolution uh, mechanism. Same thing applies to investment protection. Uh, I'd, I'd welcome comments from any of the panelists. Uh, as any question from Richard Bush, I'd expect it to be very incisive. I think that is. I agree and underline everything you've said. The two general comments that I would add to, to bring out a, a dimension of what Richard is saying is first that the example of Lenovo, which has been groomed as a national champion for, by China, at various levels, its, its degree of state as opposed to private ownership has shifted and attenuated with the years. But it's, it's really quite extraordinary uh, given the pace of change in the world to realize that uh, Lenovo has really struggled even after taking over um, the IBM ThinkPad division from IBM, which they probably overpaid for because they were not getting global traction through organic growth. They did not have the IP and they did not have the ability to innovate globally that they needed. So they essentially gave up on getting there through their own efforts, even government supported efforts, and instead they tried to acquire it. At the time they acquired it, it brought them number three in the global position of all computer makers. They were behind, at that point, Dell, which was number one, Hewlett Packard, which was number two, and it vaulted them ahead of Acer, which was number four. But in the five plus years since that acquisition happened, Dell has had very uh, serious problems as a front runner. Hewlett Packard has moved up to number one, but Acer has steadily overtaken and maintained a very strong global competitiveness position over Lenovo. All of that goes to speak to the special sauce that, that Taiwan companies have. TSMC as the innovator of a whole industry sector for foundry semiconductors is another example. Um, and then the, the other dimension, I'll try to do this more succinctly, but uh, <coughs> The, the lack of dispute resolution mechanisms, there are now movements underfoot to try to address this issue, but historically, the Taiwan business community, although representing a uh, extraordinarily influential and important part of the business community on the mainland, hasn't really had any institutionalized mechanisms for bringing the problems that they were encountering to the attention of other than a political leader through essentially kind of personal relationships. Uh, they are trying to now grapple with that issue. 
it is a, a situation which is dangerous for both sides. It, that lack of recourse can almost invite problems such as during the politically fractious period when Chen Shui-bian was elected, was running for president. Certain Taiwan companies on the mainland really seemed to be getting harassed with audits and uh, uh, so both the importance of uh, t uh, the Taiwan government delivering on the production of Taiwanese innovation and intellectual property is a key issue and the dangers posed to both sides with not having more formal and institutionalized mechanisms of dispute resolution as the situation on the mainland gets more and more complicated, as more and more commercial interests and non-commercial inf interests come to the fore and the ability of a political system through five-year plans and through um, decision-making gets seriously constrained by the complexity and the differentiation of the interests. Helen. I'm Helen Raphael, <laughs> Raphael, Resources for the Future. I taught for five years in China. Um, Mr. Cook, you talked about the three legs, and the two that connect to the United States is weak, obviously because of the recession primarily, I suppose, and uh, in order to strengthen them, we'd have to get a more robust economy. But you also referred to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, and I'm curious about what you think, even though Congress is a little bit up in the air for another month, uh, what, you, what you would like to see them do and what you think they might do with regard to strengthening these two legs that emanate from the United States to China and Taiwan. I, I would say one thing very simply, that regardless of all the a political disagreement in the air at this particular season, it's incumbent upon the U.S. to finalize its free trade agreement with Korea, which was undertaken by the U.S. government, and it's necessary to follow through and bring things to completion. And when we don't do that, it leaves questions in the minds of our Asian trading partners. Well, I'm, I'm simply saying that the probably single most important thing which is overdue and is creating consternation in Asia is the perception of a lack of a clear U.S. trade policy towards Asia, and the first step to rectify that is to finish the free trade agreement with Korea. Rice? Yes. I'd like to just step in and say uh, that I think there are different ways of looking at the U.S.-China trade relationship. And certainly it has uh, got a lot of friction in it now, both over uh, individual issues and over bigger problems, such as uh, China's pursuit of an indigenous innovation policy. But it's also true that uh, from 2008 to 2009, at a time when U.S. global exports declined by 20 percent, our exports to China were essentially flat. In other words, it was one of the best markets the United States had overseas. Right. I wonder if we can uh, perhaps turn that question around um, and look at uh, the Taiwan side of the equation. I mean, obviously, Terry has said that, um, that, that relations on a whole uh, or, 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 or the region benefits by having um, strong legs on all three sides. And this might be a question for Shelley. Um, what is it that Taiwan can do? Obviously, Taiwan stands to gain, perhaps, from an enhanced relation with, uh, relations with the U.S. Um, in terms of balancing this close relationship with um, China. I wonder if there's uh, strategies that it can employ um, to do so. Well, that has certainly been a challenge for yeah. Taiwan. On the one hand, I think, uh, for eight years, there was the perception that just not being an irritant would be enough. 
that the U.S. would be very satisfied to see the, the conflict in the Taiwan Strait stabilized and the, the sources of, of increased uh, agitation and aggravation you know, removed. And then as, almost as soon as Ma Ying-jeou was inaugurated, suddenly there's a new set of questions out there and they range from uh, is Ma Ying-jeou doing enough uh, is Maijo overly constrained in what he can do by the domestic politics of cross-strait relations to are we now, uh, does the U.S. need to sort of retrench and pull back from Taiwan because suddenly, uh, you know, Taiwan and China will have solved their problem just by virtue of this election. So I think for Taiwan, it's been a little, uh, a little bit of whiplash to try and figure out, you know, what, what are we, ex what's expected of us, and um, certainly there have been management problems like the whole beef fracas that uh, sort of stimulated the the sense in Washington that the Taiwanese still don't really have it right. But then the other big issue that uh, has, has looked like an indicator of some kind is Taiwan's request for military sales from the U.S. And it's really interesting for me as a complete outsider on both sides, you know, I'm just a humble professor. Um, <laughs> not that professors are ever really humble, but, uh, you know, we like to say that. But it does seem to me that um, that al almost as soon as the the applause had died away uh, of all the people clapping about how Maingjo was not going to, you know, start a war in the Taiwan Strait, people started asking. So, do you think he's really serious about weapon sales? So, you know, I think it's. I think the, that Taiwan, I think Ma ying has stepped up the rhetoric of uh, uh, talking about weapons and uh, talking about military, you know, working on Taiwan's military, working on Taiwan's self-defense, working with the U.S. and so on in response to that. But I, I think from, from Taiwan's perspective, it really, it's understandable how it might be difficult for them to know how to calibrate their actions to satisfy the U.S. when whatever they do seems to evoke some degree of uh, reaction and uh, anxiety on this side. Go to Bob because he's been waiting patiently. You always ask questions. <laughs> also because I signed your paycheck. <laughs> uh, thanks to all three uh, presenters for exceptionally good um, presentations. <coughs> David, I think this is for you, though I would certainly welcome uh, your colleagues jumping in. I'm somewhat struck by what seems to me to be a contrast between the way that Beijing has dealt with this issue vis-a-vis -vis Taipei versus um, some of its other actions um, toward other neighbors. Um, in this case, I think most people would say Beijing has displayed a certain adroitness, uh, a moderation, um, and a willingness to at least recognize the viewpoint uh, and perspective of the other side Whereas, um, with respect to uh, recent uh, developments relating to Sino-Japanese relations or uh, Chinese claims about uh, territorial claims in the South China Sea or even Chinese uh, protestations about um, U.S. ships, naval ships uh, in waters adjacent to uh, China, um, it has been far more provocative, far more abrasive. It's almost if, on the case with Taiwan, it's been the velvet glove uh, versus the clenched fist. Um, is there a contradiction here? Um, and if so, care to take a stab at explaining it? Uh, as always, Bob, good question. 
Uh, my stab at it would uh, make at least one point, and that is that yes, uh, uh, Beijing has been, I think, quite flexible, moderate, understanding uh, of Taiwan's needs, particularly of Ma Ying-jeou's needs, uh, even on the arms sales. They beat up on the United States, but it doesn't cause any, there's no criticism of Ma for buying the weapons and no interruption of any kind in the pattern of cross-strait relations. But it's always, I think, important to remember that uh, there are two sides of Beijing's policy, or at least two sides. Uh, and one of the other sides that is not given a great deal of attention uh, is that the PLA modernization program focused on Taiwan is going ahead, uh, that uh, the deployment of short-range, medium-range, long-range cruise missiles uh, targeted on Taiwan has not changed at all. Uh, there's not so much the numbers of those weapons increasing as uh, their accuracy, potency, uh, so that there is very definitely a hard side to Beijing's policy towards Taiwan that is, uh, is there and uh, uh, is inconsistent is seen as inconsistent by me and most other people in this town uh, with the other aspects of Beijing's approach to cross-strait relations. Uh, that's one point. If I were Taiwanese, I would worry a great deal about what the implications of a more assertive policy from Beijing might be for Taiwan at some point in time, at some point when uh, perhaps uh, Beijing would be uh, sensing that Taipei is not uh, moving in the direction it wants it at the pace it would like to see. They may not be as understanding always as they appear to be now. And if that, when that time comes, uh, how is this more assertive policy going to be uh, reflected in Beijing's dealings with us? This gentleman here. <coughs> John San with CTI TV of Taiwan. I have a question for Professor Rieger. Um, you mentioned about the uh, the U.S. concern um, over uh, the possibility of Taiwan's Finlandization um, because of FTAR. How serious, how practical is this concern? Because everything we hear from uh, State Department officials, including Kurt Campbell, uh, Jim Steinberg, they talk about uh, the bright side of it. Um, you know, um, uh, they welcome um, anything that would uh, increase cross-strait exchanges, including trade. Um, so how serious is the concern over Taiwan's possible finalization? Thank you. It's actually probably a better question for you. Somebody um, inside the beltway? <laughs> yeah, somebody <laughs> well, who really understands well the U.S. government. Well, there are two answers to every problem, an inside the beltway and outside. So you can go ahead with the outside, <laughs> outside the beltway one. <laughs> yeah, I think actually it, um, from outside the beltway, I like that, that way mm -hmm. to organize our <laughs> answer. You know, I think for people who are looking at the long-term possibilities for for those who are who are not simply focused on or who are not primarily focused on the practical necessity to manage these relationships today tomorrow Wednesday Thursday we can maybe spend more time imagining long-term scenarios both good and bad. And so I think the idea of Finlandization and that whole discourse really comes from out, certainly comes from outside the U.S. government where people are um, experimenting with or speculating about a broader range of possibilities. I think maybe within the Beltway there's, there's less concern, whether because of that more near-term focus or because people are wiser and more sensible in the government. I think probably both things are true, but David, <laughs> maybe you could, what's the inside of the Beltway view? Well, I, I think there are people in this room probably who are better plugged in than, than I am and could better answer this question, but I'll, I'll try it. There's certainly a range of opinion in Washington. Uh, part of it is uh, 
in my mind, to a certain degree, ideologically uh, driven, uh, either by people who are very anti-China or uh, people who are very pro-Taiwan independence. Uh, but I think that, uh, at least for myself and most of uh, the other people I talk to, there is a very keen awareness in Washington of the domestic limitations on Ma, or for that matter, really, whoever is going to be in power. These limitations do not just come from the opposition, the DPP. Many of them come from within the KMT party itself. Uh, and Ma, why is Ma proceeding so slowly on these issues? Uh, it's because there is domestic resistance. Even a, uh, an issue like, do we open Taiwan universities to students from the PRC and agree to uh, ex ac acknowledge or accept the degrees earned by Taiwan students at a limited number of elite uh, Chinese universities is bitterly fought over, including fisticuffs in the legislative yuan. Uh, the, the administration itself adopts a whole series of limitations that will be placed on uh, Taiwan students coming. Uh, and uh, a issue that was brought up uh, originally under Li Deng Wei is only about a dozen years later come to a limited uh, opening of, uh, of the uh, universities uh, exchange uh, possibilities. So I think pe most people uh, inside the Beltway are very conscious of the limitations on Ma and do not uh, envisage a time in, I would say, at least for people with as much gray hair as there is up here, <laughs> that, uh, that there's a any danger uh, that Taiwan is going to slip into the PRC orbit in our lifetimes. That's Speak for yourselves, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. My name is Christina from the Chinese Media Net. I have one question for, well, two questions for the panel. Um, after the ACFA, I think Chinese scholars were talking about the peace agreement between Taiwan, um, between the cross trade. But um, before the peace agreement, there has to be a um, confidence building mechanism. But it clearly doesn't really exist between the cross trade. So, um, so my, my first question is. How should Beijing push forward with a peace um, agreement or peace talk with, like, with the current Ma administration, and then also, like, perhaps maybe two th after two thousand twelve, there's a regime change, and how should Beijing cope with that? And my second question is, if China and Taiwan does go pretty closely, um, what is the implication for U.S.-China relationship? Thank you. Somebody else want to take this one on? Well, yes, sorry. I'll, I'll take a quick crack at that. Um, I talked earlier about the same bed, different dreams, but there is one very small area where the official policies of the U.S. and the Chi of China and Taiwan all do agree, and that is the beneficial effect of people-to-people -people relationships, whether that's between business communities or between tourists or between citizens. I think uh, all three governments are pretty clearly on record that they believe that good things tend to flow uh, when there is meaningful person-to-person -person interaction. Now, the idea was that ECFA is the low-hanging economic fruit where you can get win-win agreements pretty easily and then the two countries, Taiwan and China, need to move on to the more difficult task of trying to resolve long-standing political disagreements. It would seem to me that one pathway to get there, uh, and I don't operate, never have in the political orbit, so this is kind of a, a business commercial answer. But if they can <coughs> actually bring about with the tourism sector and with the agricultural sector, which is commercially a very sensitive sector in Taiwan, if they can do the relatively harder work at, in the commercial dimension 
of getting meaningful tourism flows that, that work for both sides and they can uh, overcome safety concerns and the scale of, of the China market and work out modalities that really work. That will, I think, in a small way, contribute to greater confidence and greater understanding between the two countries. And that's the type of confidence <coughs> building uh, measure that will be necessary before people can really engage on the, on the political question. I think that's an excellent way to answer that. Go ahead. Well, I was just going <coughs> to uh, take on the second question. Mm -hmm. um, the implications for U.S.-China relations of closer relations between the PRC and Taiwan, I think, depends completely on how a closer relationship between Taiwan and the mainland is brought about. So that from the U.S. standpoint, there's absolutely no downside to a closer relationship across the Taiwan Strait that is consistent with the preferences of the people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. So in other words, if there is a rapprochement, as there is currently, and if the rapprochement continues in a way that is uh, guided by or uh, sensitive to the desires of people in Taiwan as well as people in mainland China, then the U.S. Would have, will have no objection. But if a closer relationship is achieved either by sort of direct coercion or by kind of wearing down Taiwan people so that they have to give in against their will, then that will be a problem in U.S.-China relations because the U.S. has established strongly in its policy that the coercion of Taiwan people by the PRC government is a real problem for us, both in and of itself, for its own sake, and because of the precedent it sets for the use of coercion and, and uh, that kind of <coughs> aggression in international relations. So I think, you know, the U.S. The US has no um, a priori interest in keeping the two sides apart, but depending upon how the, that uh, coming together is achieved, that is what will determine how it affects U.S.-China relations. Michael, do you have another question? <coughs> Entirely Excuse me, but just because this is an important point, I want to get on the table the fact that for the DPP, if I understand it correctly, and Shelby Kim was here recently and gave its talk about this, uh, there's a real understanding of the need to rebuild confidence with the United States and also to provide the China side with the confidence that there's not going to be provocative actions. I think that should be very clear, and, I, and she was very clear about that. I want to have good relations with China based on, for her, three principles. One is transparency in the relationship, no behind-the-back deals. Secondly is democratic processes followed through the legislative yuan, and if necessary, people agreeing to resolutions that are major. And third, balance, the same issue of not just China, but China and the rest of the world is, is really on the agenda. So I think it's important because it is clearly an issue that has come up, the question of whether if there is a new government in 2012, I'm sure the Chinese are holding their cards a little close to their vest because they're worried. If we give away an inch here, the DPP will take a yard, that kind of problem. But I do think the party has learned a lot from reflecting on President Chen's time. And hopefully uh, the U.S. and Taiwan under the DPP can have a good working relationship. <laughs> are, there, are there any comments of Shelley? I think that might be one for you. Yeah, I, you know, I think transparency, democratic process, and balance are excellent principles on which to uh, approach Taiwan's policymaking uh, with regard to everything, not just cross-rate relations or ECFA or other things. And I think um, one of the, perhaps something that the U.S. might usefully at least aspire to do, and this is actually a very tall order, um, and we probably can't do it really for Beijing at all, <laughs> but at least for ourselves, 
is to come to a better understanding of the DPP and what the DPP is likely to do and how it is likely to behave in the future so that uh, we can more effectively explain, if not persuade, our friends in Beijing that the DPP is not a kind of wolf in sheep's clothing. And this is a, an ongoing challenge for, for the U.S. Mm. It's also an ongoing challenge, I think, for the DPP to itself uh, respect principles of transparency, democratic, and process in its own internal um, workings so that over time some of these suspicions can be alleviated. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that on all sides, you know, whether we're talking about the, the KMT, DPP, CCP, on you know, all of the ways that the arrows can be drawn among those three players, there's an incredible amount of distrust and an incredible amount of suspicion that what actors are saying today is not what they really have in their hearts. So the DPP suspects that Ma Ying-jeou is harboring something in his heart that he won't say with his mouth. The KMT and the CCP are pretty sure the DPP is doing that and everybody, you know. The answer, I think, ultimately, and this is what I would try most strongly to insist upon with uh, friends in the PRC is what uh, David Brown said a minute ago, which is that it doesn't really matter what's in anybody's heart other than the electorate in Taiwan, because any political leader, any political party is ultimately constrained by the need to satisfy that electorate. And I think the democratic process in Taiwan is too well developed at this point for anyone to kind of dictatorially impose from the outside. Um, so maybe I'm less worried about transparency, democratic process, and balance than I should be. Um, but I sort of think it's, it's too late for those principles to not ultimately rule the day. Uh, um, Anne. Thank you. Um, after the signing of uh, ECFA, um, the United States side have also voiced support for uh, Taiwan's um, right as a WTO member to sign any kind of economic agreements with, uh, you know, not in the name of FTA, but any kind of sort of economic cooperation agreement. Uh, but so I want to ask the panelists, um, where uh, is there any effort on the uh, between Taiwan and U.S. to re 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 uh, invigorate um, TIFA uh, after the signing of ACFA? Um, <laughs> because I've been so absorbed with U.S. trying to clean energy, I've gotten a little bit out of the details of exactly what's happening day to day. So on my drive down here, I called up Rupert Hammond Chambers at the U.S. Taiwan Business Council, and I was hoping he could give me a concise play-by-play -play of exactly where we are in the TIFA. So I will have to duck any detailed answer. It is clear to me that there is a renewed focus in energy to uh, re-engage with the TIFA process and hopefully move it forward so that even broader uh, forms of economic cooperation uh, might be envisioned and discussed. Uh, but in terms of calibrating exactly what that level of energy is, given the ups and downs of the process over recent years, uh, I, I will not try to characterize that today. But there is, uh, after some time, uh, since the beef dispute there now finally is evidence of renewed focus and energy. So, uh, I'd like to just supplement that a little bit. I, the people who manage U.S.-Taiwan relations in the government have been trying to get the TIFA process uh, going again for well over a year because they think that's uh, one way of uh, showing positive support for the Ma government 
at a time when the U.S. has not been able to do very much, uh, arms sales aside, uh, that's on Taiwan's list of things that Taiwan wants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people in USTR, commerce, agriculture, and the Congress who are interested in very narrow economic, or I should say trade issues, have always had a reason why uh, TIFA should not be started at this particular time because they want to put the pressure, they know Taiwan wants to have a TIFA meeting, and they want to put the pressure on Taiwan to concede on these narrow issues. I think now it's going to happen, uh, and that uh, uh, it, it could have happened by this time, except that uh, Taipei is aware that when the TIFA meeting happens, there is not likely to be some big breakthrough of benefit to Taiwan, and therefore they want the meeting to happen after the November elections rather than before the November elections. But it does seem that the stars are aligned and the deputy USTR will go to Taiwan probably in January uh, and get that process going again. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we'll wrap things up here. It's a little earlier than we expected to close, but it's been a, a very good and informative uh, event. Um, so if you could join me in giving um, our guests a hand. To thank you.